It was a, an incredible surprise to me to find out that there was actually an organization that cared about both parts of my life. Because basically, I work as a theoretical physicist. I develop uh, and test models of the Big Bang uh, using observational data. And I've been moonlighting for the last five years, uh, helping with a project in Africa. And I get a lot of flack for this at Cambridge. <laughs> People wonder, you know, how do you have time to do this, and so on. Um, and so it was simply uh, astonishing to me to find an organization that actually appreciated both those sides. So I thought I'd start off by just telling you a little bit about myself and why I lead this schizophrenic life. <clears throat> well, I was born in South Africa, and my parents were imprisoned for resisting the racist regime. When they were released, we left, and we went as refugees to Kenya and Tanzania. Both were very young countries then, and full of hope for the future. We had an amazing childhood, didn't have any money, but we were outdoors most of the time, uh, fantastic friends, and we saw the wonders of the world, like Kilimanjaro, Serengeti, and the old Vai Gorge. Well, then we moved to London for high school, and uh, uh, after that, there's nothing much to say about that, it was rather dull. <laughs> but I came back to Africa at the age of 17 as a volunteer teacher uh, to Lesotho, which is a tiny country um, surrounded at that time by apartheid South Africa. Well, 80% of the men in Lesotho worked uh, in the mines over the border in uh, brutal conditions. Nevertheless, uh, I, as, uh, as I'm sure, as a rather irritating young white man coming into their village, I was welcomed with incredible hospitality and warmth. But the kids were the best part. Kids were amazing, extremely eager, and often very bright. And I'm just going to tell you one story, which got through to me. I used to try to take the kids outside as often as possible, trying to connect the academic stuff with the real world. And they weren't used to that. But uh, I took them outside one day and I said, I want you to estimate the height of the building. And I expected them to put a ruler next to the wall, size it up with a finger, and make an estimate of the height. But there was one little boy, very small for his age. He's the son of one of the poorest families in the, in the village. And he wasn't doing that. He was scribbling with chalk on the pavement. And so uh, I said, I was annoyed. So what are you doing? I want you to estimate the height of the building. He said, OK. He said, I measured the height of a brick. I counted the number of bricks, and now I'm multiplying. <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> and many th experiences like this happened uh, to me. Another one was I met a miner. He was home uh, on his three-monthly leave from the mines. And I uh, was sitting next to him one day. And he said, you know, there's only one thing I really loved at school. And you know what it was? Shakespeare. And he recited some to me. <laughs> And uh, these and many similar experiences convinced me that there are just tons of bright kids in Africa, uh, inventive kids, intellectual kids, and starved of opportunity. And if Africa's going to get fixed, it's by them, not by us. Well, after... <laughs> That's the truth. Well, after Lesotho, I traveled across Africa before returning to England so gray and depressing <laughs> in comparison. Uh, and I went to Cambridge. And there I fell for theoretical physics. Well, I'm not going to explain this equation, but theoretical physics is really an amazing subject. We can write down all the laws of physics we know in one line. And admittedly, it's in a very shorthand notation. <laughs> and it contains 18 free parameters, okay, which we have to fit to the data. So it's not the final story, 
but it's an incredibly powerful summary of everything we know about nature at the most basic level. And apart from a few very important loose ends, which you've heard about here, like dark energy and dark matter, this equation describes, seems to describe everything about the universe and what's in it. But there's one big puzzle remaining, and this was most succinctly put to me by my primary school math teacher in Tanzania, who's a wonderful Scottish uh, lady who I still stay in touch with. And she's now in her 80s. And uh, when I tried to explain my work to her, she said, she sort of waved away all the details. She said, Neil, there's only one question that really matters. What banged? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone talks about the Big Bang. What banged? <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> it's a question we've all been avoiding. The standard explanation is that the universe somehow sprang into existence, full of a strange kind of energy, inflationary energy, which blew it up. But the puzzle of why the universe emerged in that peculiar state is completely unsolved. Now, I worked on that theory for a while with Stephen Hawking and others. Then I began to explore another alternative. The alternative is that the Big Bang wasn't the beginning. Perhaps the universe existed before the bang, and the bang was just a violent event in a pre-existing universe. Well, this possibility is actually suggested by the latest theories, the unified theories, which try to explain all those 18 free parameters in, in a single framework which will hopefully predict all of them. And uh, I'll just share a cartoon of this idea here. That's all I can convey. According to these theories, there are extra dimensions of space, not just the three we're familiar with, but at every point in the room, there are more dimensions. And in particular, there's one rather strange one in the most elegant unified theories we have. The strange one looks like this, that we live in a three-dimensional world. We live on one of these worlds, and I can only show it as a sheet, but it's really three-dimensional. And a tiny distance away, there's another sheet, also three-dimensional, and they're separated by a gap. The gap is very tiny, and I've blown it up so you can see it, but it's really a tiny fraction of the size of an atomic nucleus. I won't go into the details of why we think the universe is like this, but it comes out of the math and trying to explain the physics that we know. Well, I got interested in this because it seemed to me there was an obvious question, which is what happens if these two three-dimensional worlds should actually collide? And if they collide, it would look a lot like the Big Bang, but it's slightly different than in the conventional picture. Conventional picture of the Big Bang is a point. Everything comes out of a point. You have infinite density, and all the equations break down. No hope of describing that. In this picture, you'll notice the bang is extended, it's not a point. The density of matter is finite, and we have a chance of a consistent set of equations that can describe the whole process. So to cut a long story short, we've explored this alternative, we've shown that it can fit all of the data that we have about the formation of galaxies, the fluctuations in the microwave background. Furthermore, there's an experimental way to, to tell this theory apart from the, the inflationary explanation I told you before. It involves gravitational waves. And in this scenario, not only was the Big Bang not the beginning, uh, the big, as you can see from the picture, it can happen over and over again. It may be we live in an endless universe, both in space and in time, and there's been bangs in the past, there will be bangs in the future, and uh, maybe we live in an endless universe. Well, making and testing models of the universe is, for me, the best way I have of enjoying and appreciating uh, the universe. We need to make the best mathematical models we can, the most consistent ones, and then we scrutinize them logically and with data, and we try to convince ourselves, we really try to convince ourselves they're wrong. <laughs> That's progress, when we prove things wrong and gradually we hopefully move closer and closer to understanding the world. As I pursued my career, something was always gnawing away inside me. What about Africa? What about those kids I'd left behind? 
instead of developing as we'd all hoped in the 60s, things had got worse. Africa was gripped by poverty, disease, and war. This is very graphically shown by the World Mapper website and project. And so the idea is to represent uh, each country on a map, but scale the area according to some quantity. So here's just the standard area map of the world. By the way, Africa is very large. And the next map now shows Africa's GDP in 1960. It's around the time of independence for many uh, African states. Now, this is 1990, and then 2002, and here's a projection for 2015. Big changes are happening in the world, but they're not helping Africa. What about Africa's population? Population isn't out of proportion to its area, but Africa leads the world in deaths from often preventable causes. Malnutrition, simple infections, and birth complications. And then there's HIV AIDS. And then there's death from war. Okay, currently, there are 45,000 people a month dying in the Congo as a consequence of the war there uh, over coltan, diamonds, and, and other things. It's still going on. What about Africa's capacity to do something about these problems? Well, here's the number of physicians in Africa. Here's the number of people in higher education. And here, most shocking to me, the number of scientific research papers coming out of Africa it just doesn't exist uh, scientifically. And this was very eloquently argued at TED Africa, that all of the aid that's been given has completely failed to put Africa onto its own two feet. While the transition to democracy in South Africa in 1994 was literally a dream come true for many of us. My parents were both elected to the first parliament, alongside Nelson and Winnie Mandela. They were uh, the only other couple. And in 2001, I took a research leave to visit them. And while, while I was busy working, I was working on these colliding worlds <laughs> in the day. And, uh, but I learned that there was a desperate shortage of skills, especially mathematical skills, in industry, in government, in education. The ability to make and test models has become essential, not only to every single area of science today, but also to modern society itself. And if you, you don't have math, you're not going to enter the modern age. So I had an idea. And the idea was very simple. The idea was, let's set up an African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, or AIMS, and let's recruit students from the whole of Africa, bring them together with lecturers from all over the world, and we'll try to give them a fantastic education. Well, as a Cambridge professor, I had many contacts, and to my astonishment, they backed me 100%. They said, go and do it, and we'll come and lecture. And I knew it would be amazing fun to bring brilliant students from these countries where they don't have any opportunities together with the best lecturers in the world, who I knew would come because of the interest in Africa, and put them together and just let the sparks fly. So we bought a derelict hotel near Cape Town. It's an 80 room Art Deco hotel from the 1920s. The area was kind of seedy. So we got an 80 room hotel for $100,000. It's a beautiful building. We decided we would refurbish it and then put out the word, we're going to start the best maths institute in Africa in this hotel. Well, the new South Africa is a very exciting country. And those of you who haven't been there, you should go. It's very, very interesting what's happening. And we recruited wonderful staff, highly motivated staff. The other thing that's happened, which was good for us, was the internet. Even though the internet is very expensive all over Africa, there are internet cafes everywhere and bright young Africans are desperate to join the global community, to be successful, and they're very ambitious. They want to be the next Einstein. 
And so when word came out that Ames was opening, it spread very quickly via email and our website, and we got lots of applicants. Well, we designed Ames as a 24-hour learning environment, and it was fantastic to start a university from the beginning. You have to rethink, what is the university for? And that's really exciting. So we designed it to have interactive teaching, no droning on at the chalkboard. Um, we, we emphasize problem solving, working in groups, every student discovering and maximizing their own potential and not chasing grades. Everyone lives together in this hotel, lecturers and students, and not, it's not surprising at all to find an impromptu tutorial at 1 a.m. Uh, students don't usually leave the computer lab till 2 or 3 a.m., and then they're up again for 8 in the morning, uh, lectures, problem solving, and so on. It's an extraordinary place. We especially emphasize areas of great relevance to Africa's development, because there, in those areas, scientists working in Africa will have a competitive advantage. They'll publish, invited to conferences, they'll do well, they'll have successful careers. And uh, Ames has done extremely well. Here is a list of last year's graduates, uh, graduated in June, and what they're currently doing. 48 of them, and uh, where they are is indicated over here, and uh, where they've gone. So these are all postgraduate students, and they've all gone on to masters and PhD degrees in excellent places. Five students can be educated at Ames for the cost of educating one in the US or Europe. But more important, the Pan-African student body is a continual source of strength, pride, and commitment to Africa. We illustrate AIM's progress by coloring in the countries of Africa. So here you can see behind this list, when a country is colored yellow, we've received an application. Orange, we've accepted an application. And green, a student has graduated. So here's where we were after the first graduation in 2004. And we set ourselves a goal of turning the continent green. So there's 2005, 6, 7, 8. Uh, <laughs> we're well on the way to achieving our initial goal. Some of, we had some of the students filmed at home before they came to Ames, and I'll just show you one. My name is Tende Mukoba. I have a Bachelor of Science with Education degree. I will be attending Ames. My understanding of the course is that it covers quite a lot, you know, from physics to medicine, in particular epidemiology and also mathematical modeling. So Tendai uh, came to Ames and uh, did very well, and I'll let her take it from there. Uh, my name is Tendai Mugogwa, and I was a student at Ames in 2003 and 2004. After leaving Ames, I went on to do a master's in uh, applied mathematics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. After that, I came to the Netherlands, where I'm now doing a PhD in theoretical immunology. Then I was working very independently, and she communicates well with the immunologist at the hospital. So all in all, I have a very good PhD student from South Africa. So I'm happy she's here. Another student in the first year of Ames was Shehu, and he's shown here with his favorite uh, high school teacher. Uh, and then entering university in northern Nigeria. And uh, after Ames, uh, Shehu wanted to do high energy physics, and he came to Cambridge. Uh, he's about to finish his PhD, and he was filmed uh, recently with someone you all know. And from there, we'll be able to hopefully make better predictions, and then we compare with M Super and also make some predictions for LSC. That is nice. Yeah. Here are the current students at Ames, there are 53 of them, from uh, 20 different countries, including 20 women. So now I'm going to get to my TED uh, business. Well, we had a party. This is Africa. You have good parties in Africa. And last month, they threw a surprise party for me. 
Here's somebody you've seen already. <laughs> 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 I want to point out a few other exceptional people in this picture. So we were having a party. As you can see, they are completely eclipsing me at this point. This is Ezra. She's from Darfur. She's a physicist and somehow stays smiling in spite of everything going on back home. But she wants to continue in physics and she's doing extremely well. This is Lydia. Lydia is the first ever woman to graduate in mathematics in the Central African Republic, and she's now at Ames. <laughs> so now let me get to our uh, uh, the TED wish. Well, it's not my TED wish, it's our wish, as you've already gathered. <laughs> and uh, our wish has two parts. One is a dream, and the other is a plan, okay? Our TED dream is, that the next Einstein will be African. In striving for the, the heights of creative genius, we want to give thousands of people the motivation, the encouragement and the courage and to obtain the high-level skills they need to help Africa. Among them will be not only brilliant scientists, I'm sure of that from what we've seen at Ames, there'll also be the African Gates, Brins, and Pages of the future. Well, I said we also have a plan, and our plan is quite simple. Ames is now a proven model, and what we need to do is to replicate it. We want to roll out 15 Ames centers in the next five years, all over Africa. Each will have a pan-African student body, but specialize in a different area of science. We want to use science to overcome the national and cultural, cultural barriers as it does at Ames. And we want to add elements to the curriculum. We want to add entrepreneurship and policy skills. The expanded Ames will be a coherent pan-African institution, and its graduates will form a powerful network working together for peace and progress across the continent. Over the last year, we've been visiting sites in Africa, looking at potential sites for new AIM centers. And here are the ones we've selected. And each of these centers has a strong local team. Each is in a beautiful place, an interesting place, which international lecturers will be happy to visit. And our partners across Africa are extremely enthusiastic about this. Everyone wants an AIM center in their country. And last uh, November, the conference of all the African ministers of science and technology, held in Mombasa, called for a comprehensive plan to roll out AIMS. So we have political support right across the continent. It won't be easy. At every site, there will be huge challenges. Local scientists must play leading roles, and governments must be persuaded to buy in. Conditions are very difficult, but we cannot afford to compromise on those principles which made AIMS work. And we summarize them this way. The institutes have got to be relevant, innovative, cost-effective, and high quality. Why? Because we want Africa to be rich. Easy to remember the basic rules uh, <laughs> we need. So just in ending, let me say the only people who can fix Africa are talented young Africans. By unlocking and nurturing their creative potential, we can create a step change in Africa's future. Over time, they will contribute to African development and to science in ways we can only imagine. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>